if we leave Bitcoin as it is, it's, it's a new money for the 1%. The 1% can absolutely hold their own coins in a way that they really couldn't with gold in the same way. So there's, um, but the question is, are we, are we building Bitcoin to be a new money for the 1% or the 0.1% or are we building Bitcoin to be a, a new money for the world that fundamentally decentralizes people's ability to control their own finance? And certainly I'd, I'd much rather be building the, the latter thing, fundamentally decentralizing finance, not new money for the wealthy. What is up, guys? Welcome back to the show. I am Guy Swan, the guy who has read more about Bitcoin than anybody else you know. And this is Bitcoin Audible. And we have got a uh, fantastic interview today. Um, a chat which I surprised I have not had Reardon, Reardon code on the show before. But long overdue, and I thought this was fantastic discussion and a really good time to have the discussion since we've been talking about covenants and we just recently read Peter Todd's piece. And that's going to kind of be framed as the underlying context for this conversation, even though we don't talk about it specifically a lot. But I do I do bring it up just because I think it's really continuing that thread. And I thought he has he had a lot of really great points. And so much of this is ends up being. Like we end up having emotional reactions and we, we rush to judgment for a lot of these different technologies. And also there's kind of like fundamental arguments and disagreements about what even the course of action is and what we should be doing and what should even be on the table. And is, is anything an emergency? Do we need to actually make any modifications at all? And I wanted to really kind of hit all of this because there's such a huge consensus problem around making changes or, or making any sort of upgrade or shift to Bitcoin or the clients or how any of this works. And he has, I think, a really, really informed perspective on a lot of this stuff and, and on how big that challenge is and kind of what we have as options moving forward, what may or may not be realistic. So I don't want to lead too much, but I think this is this was a really, really awesome conversation, and I think it'll be really useful, and I hope you guys enjoy it, because this one is all about consensus and our consensus problems and about moving forward, about the path ahead for Bitcoin. And what does that look like, and what is even on the table? A shout out to uh, CoinKite and the Cold Card Hardware Wallet for supporting this show and making this possible. Uh, don't forget to get your cold card. Don't forget you can get a discount code, which is right there in the show notes. And a shout out to everybody on Fountain who uh, boosts and does value for value. Thank you guys so much. Uh, I see the stats. I see the comments. This is also a really great way to get in touch with me. So if you want to leave a comment or something, and it's also an easy way to earn stats, by the way, and you can listen to the show and get paid. You should check that out if you haven't. Link and details in the show notes. And with that, let's go ahead and get into our conversation with Reardon Code on Bitcoin Audible. Dude, welcome to the show, officially. And uh, we have, uh, I know, quite a bit I feel like we could talk about. So we'll see kind of which direction it goes as as the conversation unfolds. But um, for anybody who doesn't really have a strong background on you, uh, can you kind of give just a brief introduction? I mean, aside, you know, maybe I'll, maybe I'll leave in the stuff about CASA so you have background with CASA. But uh, kind of what's your uh, uh, frame of reference for Reardon Code here? Yeah, sure. I mean, well, my name, my handle gives a hint about it. Obviously, I'm a, an old school Rand, Randroid or Rand fan. Um, I grew up as an anarchist and I've been a software engineer for, good God, a long time now, professionally for over 20 years. Um, did a lot of open source stuff in college. So I was kind of connected to the open source world. Um, and so between being an anarchist and being a software developer connected to open source, it was pretty obvious to me when Bitcoin came out that this could be something. Of course, as with most people, when you first see it, everyone, including me, I'd seen Liberty Reserve, I'd seen eGold. I, I was like, oh, mm -hmm. it's not going to go anywhere. These things don't work. <laughs> yeah. So that's kind of the background on, on, on me and how I got into Bitcoin a, a little bit. So 
So yeah, it took a little bit of time. On the third touch, I finally realized Bitcoin wasn't just going to go away right away. Uh, and I've been kind of down the rabbit hole since. Um, I kind of, after Gox, I kind of took a break from paying close attention to Bitcoin for a couple of years. And then it was when Bitcoin first crossed $5,000 a coin that I really started paying attention and not long after that I got my, my job at Casa. Gotcha. Gotcha. I'm curious, as, a, as someone who codes, I've found, I talked to kind of the developers and stuff that I've been working with, and I seem, it seems to be that everybody kind of has their, their language that they use or that everything should be done this way. Do you have like, do you have like a, this is the framework, like everybody should be using Rust. Like, do you have your, like your favorite thing that you use? I'm probably less strongly opinionated now. Um, Like I said, I've been a software engineer for 20 years. I started out in Java, Mm -hmm. I've done TypeScript, I've done a little bit of Rust, I've done C, I've done Python, I've done firmware, I've done web apps, I've done all kinds of stuff. So there's lots of ways to, uh, not going to say that, there's lots of ways to do this. Um, (laughs) And I would say right now, um, Rust seems like the best language for a lot of Bitcoin stuff. I think a lot of folks are kind of right on that opinion, if you will, um, because of its its safety around things. However, C is a great language still. And I, I use TypeScript for like the Swan vault that I work on these days is in TypeScript. Um, TypeScript is also a great language. And, and people sometimes discount the benefits of developer productivity. Um, you probably know this about Bitcoiners. We tend to be a bit of an autistic bunch. And so people what? look at the... That's strange the and raw new to specific- me. <laughs> <laughs> the raw specifications of a language are like, well, that's best. Well, Rust is the best, right? But there are human factors involved in how languages go together and, and how an ecosystem for developing in a language works. And, and I think TypeScript really hits a lot of the right notes in terms of that combination of the way working in TypeScript feels to a person working in it. Uh, so I find that to be a very pro- productive language, even if it's not it has all kinds of ugly warts. Objectively, it's kind of terrible, uh, <laughs> but it works really well. Gotcha. Gotcha. Now, I've actually heard kind of the same thing in TypeScript in particular, I've heard is extremely popular with newer coders, um, uh, as I understand it. But yeah, it's a good place to start. Kind of TypeScript and yeah. Python are, are the starting points for a lot of people. Yeah. Yeah. But I was actually meaning about coding in general. Like, oh, okay. Why, well, did you, why did you do it, I guess? Yeah. Uh, so TypeScript, the syntactic sugar they've added over the years, just makes expressing what I want the computer to do uh, as as close to what I'm thinking as possible. I'm having a thought about how I want the code to end up, and mm-hmm. it ends up that way. With a lot of other languages, you're you're forced in C, you're forced to deconstruct things into smaller thoughts, and in in Rust, you're forced to kind of twist yourself around to make sure the compiler is going to be happier. <laughs> uh, and in TypeScript, you can pretty much just do it the way you're thinking it. And that's a nice thing. Okay. Uh, in terms of what I like about coding, man, I've been coding for such a long time now. I learned to code on a Commodore 64 when oh. I was a little kid, when I first learned to read. Oh, basically. name drop. Oh, my God. <laughs> um, I'm not an OG or anything, whatever, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Yeah, I don't have the gray beard to show that I've been doing this for a long time. <laughs> so I have to kind of drop a little bit sometimes. Um, so yeah, I, I, I've been coding for a very long time. And, and I, think, I think it ties into to freedom. Uh, same reason I run Linux. You know, it's terrible in, in many ways. But, but you can oh actually change the world that you're living in by modifying computer code. And that's something that when I, when I wrote... I was working on the, the nipples game and I made the nipple game into a quiz show where every time you got one of the little dots in the nipples game, it asked you a quiz question. <laughs> and I was like, I did that. I changed that game. Um, and that kind of stuff just has had me hooked since, you know, many, many years ago. Nice. Nice. No, I've, oh God, the, the amount of identification with, oh my God, I hate Linux, but it's the only thing I love, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Oh, it's a I mess can't screen sometimes. share properly, but I'm not going to change using yeah. it, right? I can't use. I'm. I have to be on my Mac right now because this camera refuses to work with my <laughs> Linux machine. <laughs> but I still have like 80 percent of my main services running on Linux. Oh yep. shit! 
Well, uh, uh, I'm curious. So in like for, for the audience's context here is a lot of what kind of encouraged me to reach out to you was really in reference to Peter Todd's piece on the covenant proposals and the, the review of all of the kind of like L2 systems and designs and what's needed to kind of like flesh them out. But uh, since then, I've had a number of converse- conversations with different groups in different places. And it's funny how broad everybody else's take on it is, or just in general, like the number of opinions on it all, uh, which is funny because you specifically mentioned consensus in general. As like, well, how the hell do you do that? And ironically, that's been my issue is the the consensus and the conversations are all over the place. You know, some people like CTV plus CFSS, uh, CSFS. And uh, then I had this pretty, pretty serious and I would say um, well thought out rather than kind of the normal reactionary uh, arguments about why we don't need to change anything and we shouldn't be thinking about changing anything. If there's no, there's no emergent, like what's the emergency, you know, we're passing two sats per byte right now. Um, so, uh, uh, maybe give me your big picture view before we start to nail down into specifics on this one. Yeah. Big picture. Um, a couple of thoughts come to mind. And one is something that I've said on, on X before, but I don't think I've said it enough. So I'm, I'm glad to have the opportunity. And that is that in a lot of things in, in the human world, by the time something becomes a critical need, whether that's scaling solutions for Bitcoin, whether that's um, getting off the planet because there's an asteroid coming, whatever the thing might be, <laughs> it's kind of too late by the time it's a critical need. And, and I think that's something that, that, People who are kind of, oh, everything's fine. It's two sats per byte. They're not attentive to that reality. That if if we are in a situation where fees are already a thousand sats per V byte persistently and we haven't done anything more than lightning, we're in a world of hurt and people are going to be stuck in custodial systems. And I, I'm not positive. I don't I don't know that we can go back from that once everyone is forced into custodians because they couldn't use Bitcoin with lightning. So I think that's that's why my kind of response, kind of at a high level of why why are we having this conversation? Why is it worth having this conversation now versus waiting some years to to continue this consensus building conversation? And then the other thing, I agree with you exactly what you've seen the the many different opinions, the the it's so fragmented um, in the ecosystem in different thoughts around the topic of consensus and what the right way to go forward is, um, and. One of the things that I've been realizing is we each live in our own little bubbles of it. And so within my bubble, certain details of this are obvious. Within your bubble, maybe some other details are obvious. And and we have overlap, of course, um, but there's so many separate bubbles with very little overlap. And the things that are obvious to each bubble are not obvious to others. And I don't know what to do about that. It's been something I've been really thinking about um, especially very recently with Peter Todd's post and other things, how do we how do we start to bring together these different bubbles and kind of get everyone at least on the same page of which things are obvious? Because if we can't even agree about which things are obvious, I don't know how we're going to build the rest of a consensus around how how Bitcoin moves forward. No, I I completely agree, and I'm actually curious what because that was one thing that I found interesting in one of the conversations that I had is that one of the things that I was taking as a kind of a primitive into the conversation was actually something that we disagreed with. And I didn't realize it until pretty far into the conversation. And I was like, oh, Jesus. So we're not even we're not even starting from the same baseline of what ought to be done, you know. And so I'm curious from, let's say, just for uh, for the sake of subjectivity, um, that in your bubble, what are the obvious things to you that I guess should be done? Not necessarily like, like, oh, we should do CTV. I mean, like, what are the obvious things for how we should think about designing this to act to work for all of the kind of proposals or concepts for how to actually achieve the goal that we're trying to achieve? And I guess I guess also mention what is the goal? 
you, you know, like, cause sometimes we don't agree on that either. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, I think the, for me, the, the obvious things are, are one Bitcoin as it is right now does is not sufficiently better than gold to be money for the next thousand years. You know, I, I love when Michael Saylor says changes you make Bitcoin must be thinking about the next thousand years, but that presumes that Bitcoin will even last that long as a good money. And given recent history of monetary things, gold was co-opted in the last 250, 300 years, let's say. And that will happen faster to Bitcoin because the playbook's already been run unless Bitcoin is sufficiently different from gold. And so some would say, well, Bitcoin can be moved without a cargo ship. So the thing that happened to the French trying to get their gold out of the US uh, 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 reserves won't happen. I think that was a French, whatever. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, no, I think that it was a it was a French battleship. Um, yeah, or it wasn't actually a battleship. But there was there was some specific designation or whatever that I remember. I looked it up and it was like fact checked. Um, but, but it was a French <laughs> military ship brought into the the bay in New York. Yeah, to try and get their gold. And, and so, well, well is that going to be any different with Bitcoin? Well, if if all the Bitcoin is held at Coinbase, like it is kind of right now, Coinbase custody holds a huge swath of Bitcoin. Um, will it be any different? Well, no, it won't be any different. The the what makes Bitcoin special is the ability to hold your own keys. And that's something that right now we're seeing play out in real time that it's not different enough from gold. And so the goal is to make Bitcoin different enough from gold that it can last that thousand years and be a better money for, for people who need it, for countries who need it. Uh, you know, I'm an anarchist. I don't think countries should exist, but I also do think that people have a right to self determination. So if they've formed a country, well, they should be able to get their gold, right? Their their Bitcoin. Um, yeah. So that, that's the goal part of this is is making Bitcoin a a useful enough, materially better enough money system than gold that it lasts for those thousand years. I think that's a really worthwhile goal. It's something that I think most of us are are kind of trying to make real. Even even the folks, right? And that's the place where we can agree. Even the folks that are kind of against changing Bitcoin, they actually have that same gold. They think it's different enough already than gold. I don't, but at least we have the same goal of making Bitcoin a money that's going to last for that thousand years. So yeah. I talked to, to Vijay Boyapati about whenever we chat. <laughs> um, and then the, the, other, the other, other thing that I think is uh, to me and to my group of, of Bitcoiners obvious is that in order to make that last and to make it good enough, people can hold their own keys, et cetera. Uh, we need some degree of more freedom in how we lock Bitcoin. There's this joke that I only heard recently, and I really enjoy it, that uh, in, in Bitcoin, we have a bunch of script stuff, and then we have op checksig, otherwise known as op do Bitcoin. Because most of what Bitcoin script has is some really, really basic script operations. And then there's op checksig, which is the one thing that was kind of bolted on by Satoshi when he was developing the script language that's specific to Bitcoin as opposed to some really, really basic stuff. Mm -hmm. And op OpJexig is basically opdo Bitcoin because that's how we lock Bitcoin. And, there, and it's even, we, we know even more this is the case with Taproot because before Taproot, every time you spent some Bitcoin, actually, sorry, before um, native SegWit, I, and it, there's a little nuance there I'll, I'll get to in a second. I, it, we always had a script somewhere, whether it was a P2SH script or a P2WSH script. Um, but in, in native segwit, pay to witness pub key hash, the script is much more hidden, but it technically is still represented by a script. And then in taproot, the script is completely gone. If you're doing a single sig taproot address, there's no script behind it at all. It, the, internally, the system just takes the, the key and the signature and runs a checksig against it automatically. So with taproot, we actually really made it that op checksig equals do Bitcoin. Uh, and then, sure, we also have the scripting system, but basically there's, there's just do Bitcoin code. And, and so my, my point there is, is merely that we need some additional operations beyond just op do Bitcoin and op if, which is most of what we really have in order to, to continue developing this system and to build for more people to be, able, to be able to hold their own keys. So yeah, the details of exactly what things we might need in order to expand that, that do Bitcoin functionality beyond that one operation, 
um, or there's like two or three of them, but whatever. The, the point is that those basic yeah, yeah, yeah. objects and ops um, are, are kind of to be discussed, but we definitely need more than that to, to, let, to get Bitcoin to be better than gold enough, in my opinion. And that's where it gets to opinion is like, <laughs> uh, but there's some obvious parts. So we need to do something and we want it to be for the next thousand years, a uh, better money. Yeah, no, I, and I, I'd certainly agree on that in framing, but I actually want to disagree with something specific because this is something that I feel like a lot of people miss about the degree. And if Bitcoin gets captured, I actually don't think it gets captured in exactly the same way that gold did. Um, and there's a specific reason why, like when we think about trying to make this thing last a thousand years and we think about the scale at which we want be want people to be able to take their sovereignty and mm -hmm. to basically contest a corrupt uh, bank or or jurisdictional system that's going to try to say they can or cannot do or you're going to work in paper Bitcoin and not real Bitcoin, you know, whatever that situation is, um, which obviously we have an, an unlimited number of examples of um, is. There's something interesting about how Bitcoin as something digital scales that is inverse to gold because it's actually easy to protect yourself individually with gold, even though it's not easy to transact because you can obviously can't send gold over a communications line, but you can keep one gold coin. There's a lot of people out there with one gold coin or one gold bar or something who just has it locked away in their safe. But it's almost impossible when you're talking about a billion dollars worth. Then this it scales in reverse. The larger the capital pool becomes, the more difficult it is to not have it under the control of a bank or a government. Whereas the opposite is actually true with Bitcoin. When you're dealing with small amounts, it's really difficult to not to use a custodian for a hundred bucks for, you know, 50 bucks, quote unquote, worth of value in Bitcoin because of transaction fees, because of the fact that you have a bidding war every time you broadcast. And, you know, lightning is still just from a technological standpoint, there's still just a lot of difficulty in doing it yourself, you know. Um, but when you're talking about a million dollars or a billion dollars, it's extremely easy when you're when we're talking about a 20 trillion dollar market, the ability to just kind of withdraw a trillion dollars out of a jurisdiction to just be like, eh, I don't want to be here anymore can literally happen in 10 minutes. And that is such a fundamental shift on a historical timeline. Like capital controls would go in for years and the degree of like fine tuning and people at the border and searching and making, pulling shit out of people's hair that would go through just to prevent a billion dollars from crossing the borders in history. I think, and it's not, it's not a complete caveat. It's not something that just totally makes the point moot without uh, even slightly. There's still, you're still looking at everybody under $2,000 potentially being stuck, you know? Um, but the fact that large pools of capital can move, I think means that at the, at the kind of business, the uh small institution the family trust the country level you have a completely new power dynamic like a huge shift in the power dynamic where el salvador can literally hold el salvador's treasure treasury el salvador can literally communicate and trade with any country on earth and there's nothing the american banking system can do about it um so it's still the playing field is still drastically different but you are right that on a thousand year timeline, you know, 200 years out, we get to the point where that decentralization literally only got us one step up in the plateau. And what we wanted to do was to be able to continue to cascade that to everybody in the world. Right. So just just an interesting point that I feel like is uh, not to dismiss dismiss it, because I do completely agree with the framing. Um, and on a long enough timeline, it's 100 percent true, in my opinion. Yeah, no, I, I love that. And it, it's a great point. I, I said something like that when I was when I was on uh, Levera with VJ that, you know, if, if we if we leave Bitcoin as it is, it's, it's a new money for the 1%. Because yeah, as you said, the 1% can absolutely hold their own coins in a way that they really couldn't with gold in the in the same in the same way. So there's, um, but the question is, are we are we building Bitcoin to be a new money for the 1% or the 0.1%? Or are we building Bitcoin to be a, a new money for the world that fundamentally decentralizes 
people's ability to control their own finance. And uh, uh, certainly, I'd, I'd much rather be building the, the latter thing, fundamentally decentralizing finance, not new money for the wealthy. 100%. 100%. Um, uh, on that note, from a de- design philosophy perspective, you you mentioned specifically the ability to lock up coins in a different way or in a new way. Um, and what's interesting to me about just the idea of covenants, it's, it's so funny, like covenants seem really obvious to me. And it's why I've ended up coming in support of CTV specifically, because it's such a just the idea of it locking to a hash just kind of saves you a lot of complication or kind of like, well, what happens next? It's like, well, it's just, it's just a hash. You already know what comes next, period. It's, it's underneath that. Like somebody had to plan it out, you know? Um, but uh, it seems intuitive to me that the idea is to separate one UTXO into a bunch of different ownership, individual ownership, you know? Um, and is that, the same kind of like easy target or or obvious step in your mind is that that's the goal is that that's the granularity we don't have is that one utxo is still one person in a sense you know i think so uh i've been talking to lots of different people over the i guess it's about a year that i've been kind of publicly active in the in the bitcoin conversation i've talked to lots of people about this and and when you boil down pretty much every proposal for Bitcoin layers, whatever whatever that means, they're all in some way or another sharing UTXOs, right? Even Lightning is two people sharing a UTXO, and that's yeah. why it works. Because within that shared UTXO, they can push money back and forth. And then you can connect to other people pushing money back and forth within a shared UTXO, and now you have a network. Um, so I think so I think yes, that that's the the fundamental building block. And then um, the details do matter, though, right? So there's there's right now the in the broader scope of different ways to share UTXOs. Uh, there's you can have a pegged UTXO sharing like Liquid. With Liquid, they have a bunch of separate UTXOs, and people deposit into those UTXOs at different times. The functionaries do, and they kind of generate Liquid Bitcoin by depositing into different shared UTXOs. So they have there's a pool of UTXOs shared by everyone in Liquid Network. So that's one way of doing it. You could have something like uh, an arc where there's a series of shared UTXOs where every, whatever the period is for a particular arc, there's a new UTXO that's shared by a bunch of people and then those can hop to a new shared UTXO. So they kind of chain or, or, or have a series of shared UTXOs. Uh, or you could have something more like uh, a roll-up where in a roll-up, the general design space of a, of a roll-up is going to be one big shared UTXO that progresses along with the, with the alternate chain. And so that's another, so there's there's a few different designs for it, but they kind of all boil down to sharing UTXOs so that more people can use Bitcoin. The most important thing that you can do in order to secure your Bitcoin is to use a secure, trusted, long-running hardware wallet in the Bitcoin space and do one that is Bitcoin only, like the cold card. Not only do they have the cold card Mark IV, which is the cypherpunk calculator, but they also now have the cold card Q, which has the large screen, has a full QWERTY keyboard, has a flashlight, and a QR code scanner. It is the cypherpunk Blackberry of the cold card series. And if you are looking to keep your Bitcoin safe and you want all of those advanced features, you want to do some custom setup with multi-sig, you want security features for those edge case scenarios where you need a brick me pin or a dummy pin that opens up to a fake wallet. The cold card has it all. And if you don't want to complicate your setup or you don't need any of those advanced features, you can use it simply as a secure default Bitcoin signing device. Keep your seed, keep your keys off of your desktop computer, off of your phone, and securely and easily use your Bitcoin. If you do not have a cold card or you haven't even checked it out yet, Go to coinkite.com. The link will be right in the show notes. And don't forget that when you are at your checkout, the code Bitcoin Audible, all one word, will get you a discount. That will also be right in the show notes in case you forget about it. Keep your keys safe and get yourself a cold card. You know, the one thing that I've found out about rollups that I hadn't even realized is that they are the literal opposite of privacy. (laughs) And in every way. And I, I hadn't put that together. I had 
intuitively just think that, okay, well, you have a lot more options for privacy and a lot more availability or, or just kind of, yeah, optionality. Optionality is really the word for privacy if you're going off chain. And I was a bit shocked when I talked to Burak about exactly the degree that, or at least roll ups, you know, on Bitcoin um, are literal just. A, pri a privacy nightmare worse than Bitcoin, really, um, in almost every way, because you you take the one cap, the one like kind of decent thing about Bitcoin is that the UTXO model, you still don't know exactly what's what's what. You know, somebody can have twenty UTXOs, and if you're not cross signing, you don't. It's, there's no obvious way to tell. You can still you can still coin manage and nunchuck or whatever, and you know, make sure that stuff doesn't cross. Um, whereas in rollups, you don't. It's, purely an account system, you know? Um, but anyway, that's just a, just a thing that I found out very recently that I didn't know about. Um, it, it can vary there, with mm -hmm. rollups. There, there can be other internal designs that provide some level of privacy. Uh, and, and truthfully, pretty much all of these layer two proposals, they do trade some degree of privacy to the participants directly in your UTXO sharing. And that's true of Lightning mm -hmm. too, of course, right? When you have a channel yeah. with someone, yeah. that channel partner knows exactly what goes through the channel. And, and so there's, there's always some kind of a trade-off there. And uh, you mentioned Barack. So, you know, in the original design for ARC, he proposed having kind of a, a blind signing e-cash scheme along with the VTXOs to, to and also coin joining at, at equal values across each, each ARC um, pool transaction. So... There are ways to get more and less privacy. They're always making some level of trade-off with either a coordinator or the other participants in the second layer. Um, but it it doesn't have to be all bad, essentially, even, even with roll-ups. There, there, yeah. there, there can be different role designs. And I actually, I just learned from Eric Wall on one of my spaces recently that uh, most of what we're calling roll-ups on Bitcoin don't meet the definition of roll-ups on Ethereum. In Ethereum, rollups were built because computation is costly and is the main thing you're paying gas for. And so the rollups would backfill all of the data about the state of the rollup onto the Ethereum chain. The full status of the rollup uh, account would be put on the Ethereum chain. And so there wasn't this data availability problem that people are having when they're trying to build for Bitcoin because Bitcoin has a different problem. On Bitcoin, there's not this computational gas cost you have to pay to transact. And so you're not trying to roll up and kind of just get the gas out. You're actually trying to get the data off on Bitcoin mm -hmm. because on data on Bitcoin you pay for data stored to the chain, and so that's a, a different fundamental problem. So when we look at rollups on Ethereum and rollups on Bitcoin, we almost need a separate word because on Bitcoin we're kind of trying to push the data off to a different layer as opposed to the computation off to a different layer. Uh, anyway, there, there's words are hard, which comes back yeah. to that consensus problem that we don't even have words that we all know the same definitions of because people are saying rollups on Bitcoin and they mean a fundamentally different thing to what rollups on Ethereum mean. So yeah. welcome to the world. <laughs> <laughs> because it's a vague, big, giant question, I want to see what first comes to your mind when you think about it. In the problem of consensus, what's, what's the thing that you're like, this is just hard? This this particular piece of it is what always runs into a problem. To me, it seems to be um, I'm going to call it emotional baggage. I think all of us came away from the various pieces of our history in Bitcoin, whether it was the block size war itself, or whether it was fighting with Roger Ver directly, or whether it was some other piece of the history of Bitcoin. And I'm including myself in this, right? I'm not trying to exclude myself. We each came away with certain emotional hangups. And so you'll see when various people, myself included, make posts, of, whether it's on the mailing list or on, on Delving or on X, about certain topics. We, we get not a, a reasoned response, but, but some level of, of just gut emotional response that says someone has, has trauma around this topic and they can't think rationally around it. And, and and this happened. I mean, with with uh, Jeremy Rubin when he first uh, tried to to talk about an activation client for uh, CTV, and there and there was just hysterical responses from some people at the idea that he would publish a, an activation client for something outside of Core on his own time. He would build and publish some software, and the fact that people had such a deep emotional reaction to the idea of one intelligent developer 
publishing a client that some people might run to activate some code on Bitcoin that was well reviewed and was not dangerous. That that that's and we've seen various versions of that. I mean, that's just an example, uh, and that makes the process of consensus building is is frequently just derailed by emotional responses. And again, I'm not immune to this. You know, when I when I first started into this conversation, I I had an emotional response to Cat because I had misread Andrew Polster's blog post, and I was I had I had put into my brain that if we make Bitcoin too general, we're going to have these problems. And then I'd misread Andrew Polster's blog post about OpCat and thought that it could do everything. And so I was like, well, Cat is obviously not it. It's the it's the monster. It's evil. I had all this you know, and again this this kind of trauma based enemy imagery about it, and it took. I don't know, six, seven months of really kind of focusing on this stuff before uh, I started to to kind of calm down that emotional response. And I, I'm I'm not sure how to do that on a broad scale for for Bitcoiners to to let people start thinking about things with the part of their brain that can think. Uh, but I think that's the biggest hang up. Yeah, yeah. There's a great quote. Um, it's a quote that goes something like, "We we go insane all at once." in a big group and you know in like a giant group think and we only gain back our sanity very very slowly one at a time <laughs> um no i was I, I had kind of had the exact reaction that you mentioned here with ctv and i had a bunch of different episodes about it because i was like all right i gotta understand how this works um my issue is funny so many people were so aggressively against him releasing a separate client but at least quickly throughout that process my issue was less that it wasn't through bitcoin core like i've i've always kind of had an affinity for the idea of like and i think this is just because i ran uasf um is that no i think it's good to have some other client try to do stuff and maybe we should consider running that one instead uh especially if it just forces core to support something without the, like i don't like the fact that we are always just leaning on this, which is really just kind of like a malga, like a an ephemeral group of people. It's not like, you know, it's not like a solid organization with some strict thing. Like it just people kind of come in and out, you know. Um, and uh, and so that reliance has always been a vulnerability, in in my opinion. Um, but uh, even I think while I was still against CTV, I tried to make note that I thought. What Ruben did, even though it ended up being um, uh, so controversial from a like political perspective, and especially because it was also it also felt rushed in the fact that it was like we're just going to do this now. Um, but so many in the public, like so many of the general Bitcoiners, did not know anything about CTV, myself included. I really was, what the what is this? You know, um, and so I started taking in all of the general fud about it and being like you know the idea of a recursive covenant is an extremely th easy thing to be scared about to to be concerned about um and it really wasn't until i just understood it's like no dude it's a hash you know you can't you can't have a hash of a hash inside of the hash <laughs> you know like that's not that's not you're not gonna be able to spin that circle and just keep that going forever um so uh, uh but i you know it took me I don't know, probably, probably similar amount of time, three to six months of talking to people and going back and reading another article about it and having somebody be patient with me and be like, dude, please just shh for, shh for a second. Let me, this is how it actually works. And then I was like, oh shit, this is not, this is not nearly, nearly like all, every major thing that I was emotional and bothered about was not true. It was essentially just not how it worked. Um, and it's hard to overcome that. It's very, yeah. it's very hard to go through that process. And I'll, I'll admit that's kind of my position right now on OpCat. Um, it seems right. obscure. It seems overly convoluted with how constructions are for apparent simple things. And that, that just alone without having any foundation of how it works really, like I could, I couldn't write a thing in OpCat, you know, like without that, it just seems crazy to me to have a thing that where if you did it a little bit wrong and you have to do something with like 50 pieces as opposed to just CTV to this thing, that seems like a kind of kind of going back to your TypeScript versus C 
mentality is like, well, mm -hmm. you know, simple is also just better <laughs> for for building tools. Also, you know, a brick is not a complicated thing and you could do a lot with a lot of bricks. Um, so anyway, maybe maybe convince me, do your do that little piece of the puzzle of, you know, patience shush, shush for a second. Why am I wrong about OpCat or what am I missing about OpCat that maybe I'm taking the same perspective as I did with CTV? Well, I, I would say in some ways I, I agree with you. Um, OpCat is on its own a kind of a bad idea and because of exactly what you said, right? Now, I've had some conversations with Andrew Polstra and with Ryan Dahl about it, where they've at least partially softened my view on that. And, and I'll try to do the same, pass that along, essentially. Um, it's true that constructions with OpCat for covenants um, or for even you know recursive covenants or, or carrying data, but from one transaction to the other uh, for things like the Perfect Vault that Ryan Dahl built, those are complicated. And I think Perfect Vault, the, the overall per Perfect Vault script has like 200 cats in it or something ridiculous. Um, <laughs> holy crap <laughs> but it it's it's okay is what they would say and I, and I think I've at least partially come around to that view because this is something that wallet builders already do we have tools like miniscript that build scripts we would never come up with on our own the fact that you or I can't necessarily write those scripts doesn't mean we can't use them and so someone whether it be Andrew or Randall or someone else can write tools that compile covenants for us using OpCat. We can audit those tools. We can have many people audit those tools. And then we can start using those tools at the higher level, the same way we already do with Miniscript. Gotcha. And so when I look at, for example, the Anchor Watch compiled descriptor, I wouldn't have written it the way, if I was trying to build the Anchor Watch policy, I would have made mistakes. I would have gotten that policy wrong. Um, but because they used Miniscript, they can they can kind of look at the Miniscript, they can confirm that the policy is what they want in the end. Um, but someone else helped them by auditing Miniscript first. And the same can be true for an OpCat-based construction. So that's, that's the argument that at least from the perspective of, do we need to have something that's developer-friendly at this low-level script language? We don't need to. We can have a compiler for that that says, okay, you want a covenant that restricts the whatever, the first inputs ha sig ha uh, script pub key to be the same as the second output script pub key. Let me compile that into OpCat for you. And that's, that's a totally doable. We do that with assembly. That's how, all, you know, we do that all the time with computers. That's what computers are good at. We can write the code that does that correctly, and then we can use that code. Uh, so that's the argument there. The other thing with OpCat that I think I, I, I'm also kind of remain uncomfortable with a little bit, so I'll, I'll pass along my reality filter there a little bit, is there is this concern that is very hard to fully put to bed about whether um, we're going to introduce incentive distortions in terms of how miners get paid. And, and the simplest form of how to understand this is right now, with Bitcoin the way that it is, each transaction is attached to at least one UTXO. So a specific bit of Bitcoin must be spent with this next transaction. And one of the challenges of pretty much everything that we're talking about in covenant space, including OpCat, is that we are going to probably break that strict connection. Even this kind of the, the two simplest ways of doing um, covenants that are kind of out there in terms of the simplest in terms of reasoning about the consensus or, or the uh, uh, incentives of them are, are any prev out and CTV. So stick exchange prev out and CTV, those are a big part of why they're useful is because they allow the same transaction to be attached to this UTXO or this one, right? We have the same transaction mm -hmm. go here or here. And if we've done that, we have fundamentally introduced the opportunity for miners or other parties on the network to reorder transactions in a way that wasn't possible before because each transaction specifically chained off of some previous UTXO. Mm -hmm. And so when talking through these things over the year or so, again, that I've been active in this, you know, that's the thing that's hard to fully put to bed about any of these 
proposals. And the challenge is that that's the most useful thing that they do. So the most useful thing that these things do is also the thing that's hardest to fully put to bed, whether that causes a challenge where miners can now insert transactions and reorder transactions in ways that might be beneficial to miners, but therefore might be harmful to users of the protocol and also might break miner incentives in a way where miners that have complex reordering software might have an advantage over miners that don't. Interesting. But that applies to CTV, to APO, to all of these things. When you mean reorder, so like let's say there are, you know, two inputs that have a kind of any any prev out situation and something gets confirmed. Are you meaning that there's like risk of reorg in which there is a completely different order and a completely different UTXO actually being spent? Or are you meaning maybe give me maybe give me a concrete example? In, in in kind of like uh, what the what the negative looks like in practice as opposed to in theory if you've if you got one off the top of your head actually yeah so here's a really simple example um with lightning symmetry the the fundamental way lightning symmetry works is that any given update transaction to the channel can be spent by any later update transaction yeah and so when you want to force close the Lightning Symmetry channel, the first person who wants to close it takes their latest update and publishes it. There's then a, t a delay where the other party could publish a later update to correct the state of the channel. Mm -hmm. um, if those both get published at the same time, let's say both parties realize that the channel's offline and this one has state nine, this one has state 11, they both publish those states. The best situation would be that only 11 confirms. So they both mm -hmm. published these transactions spending from the uh, from the commitment transaction, because you can spend either the commitment or any update. So they both spend from the commitment transaction. What the miners can do is they can include both. They can change the state 11 one to instead of spending the commitment transaction to spend the, um, the update nine transaction. So they get both fees. Mm -hmm. So is this a major deal? Well, no. But the miners do get more fees because they observed these two transactions and they reconnected 11 to 9 instead of 11 to commitment. And so the miners get more fees they by doing that. They rebuilt the transaction as opposed to uh, as opposed to the user having control over what that transaction looks like. Yep. Yep. Interesting. Because that transaction didn't restrict exactly which UTXO was being spent, the miners the signature could change was valid the signature for either one of them. Yep. Yep. Interesting. So again, it's not a huge deal in that case, but it does give the miners an opportunity if the channel closes simultaneously with two different states to get more fees than what the users intended. Mm -hmm. Now, in the end, that's still the valid person getting the coins. Yep. And yep. it's still, uh, it, it's just that it's no longer, what what is fundamentally supposed to be a competition between what is valid is now a uh how much can I include? Like, can I get everybody to pay a fee here, even though only one person is getting coins? <laughs> yep. Interesting. Yep. Yeah, and, and that's like a simple example. That these yeah. things can get very convoluted. The the more when designing a protocol based on reorder rebindable transactions, mm -hmm. if you're not very careful, you can end up in situations that can be pretty bad for users. Mm -hmm. um, this one's, you know, not a huge deal. The two people paid a fee. They both were trying to close the channel. It, it's actually kind of fine because one of them did publish an out-of-date transaction. Um, one valid thing would have been for the other party to wait, see that transaction, and then publish the correct transaction, which would have spent off of that one anyway. So it's not like there's a big problem in this particular scenario, but it's just a kind of small example. Because they're rebindable, the miners get this opportunity to, to do to do their own specialized reordering or rebuilding of transactions to gain more fees. How does CTV or just like the covenant concept in general essentially enable this? The short version is because with covenants, part of the point of what we're doing is getting, making transactions where we don't need a fresh signature, right? Though, like a CTV is basically a, a pre-signed transaction without the signature because it, as mm -hmm. you said, all it does is a hash of the next transaction. So it has to be this next transaction. But if you have, and this is one of the things that Jeremy Rubin addressed in the um, CTV BIP, if you have two UTXOs of the same, at the same script pub key, the same uh, uh, locking script, um, either UTXO can be spent with the same CTV. 
So you have to be very careful in building these things that you never have simultaneously mm. existing two different UTXOs with the same locking CTV because they could both be spent by the same one. So if a miner sees one, they could actually take uh, they, that they one and that spend piece both out at the same it, time. Stick it on the other one and be like, well, I'm going to publish this instead. Interesting. Yeah. So CTV is less likely on its own to be used in this way uh, mm -hmm. due, frankly, to the lack of a rebindable signature. And he out is more likely to be used in this way because you have a rebindable signature yeah, where parties can what, agree to a signature and is. then that signature yeah. is valid. Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> quite different you take those. <laughs> it does exactly this thing. Yeah. Um, CTV, people who build CTV tools would be less likely to build a situation where the same CTV is going to be spending two different UTXOs. And the way to do that is not to reuse UTXO addresses, essentially. If you never use an address, you don't have this problem. It's it's similar, it's different different outcome, but it's a similar risk of being like just having like a wallet policy of like let's not you reuse the same UTXOs. You know, like every time you go, the wallet just automatically gives you a new UTXO. Um, so it would probably be like a client side. This is the standard for how we operate in this new world, so to speak. Um, interesting, interesting. I hadn't thought about that from the context of. Uh, um, CTV specifically, because because my thinking was just like as a hash, and that does that does make sense there. Um, well, how could they pre present themselves in the network to cause a problem? And also in the context of recursive covenants, let's use Opcat as an example. And maybe you don't know this off the top of your head, but is or maybe this is much more obvious than i think if i give you an address to spend to me is there any way that you can burden that with something i had not intended that i have not pre suggested as okay there is here's this script underneath it or here's it's just my key etc cetera, etc cetera. or or if i give you my pub key is there is there some sort of relationship there where you can burden it with something that I had not intended, even though I just gave you something to pay me. Not, I mean, not in any way that is, it would be new with CTV okay. or cat or anything. The, the thing to realize is if someone can modify in any way, your address right now, they could add an additional op check sig operator onto it and be like, you have to have my, my signature and yours. Mm -hmm. Right. So if, if, if we assume that the sender can modify the destination before sending, then yes, they can do whatever. They can add an additional check sig for their own key. Mm -hmm. They can also add a recursive cat covenant. They can also add a CTV covenant. They could do whatever if they can modify the destination before sending. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the pattern of how we use Bitcoin, the, and, and frankly, also, I've mentioned this, the, the, the way the legal system works when, when you agree to a contract for payment, you specify how, what valid ways you are willing to accept that payment, whether that mm -hmm. be a Bitcoin address or a physical mailing address or gold, cash, whatever. Um, you specify the ways. And if someone doesn't pay you in the ways that you've specified in the, in the agreement, you they haven't pay. paid you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so that's, that's fundamental. And that applies whether there's CAT or CTV or just OpJexig. Uh, if the sender is modifying the address by adding additional condition to it, they are not actually paying you. They're paying somebody, but they're not paying you. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Okay. Then going back to the general, and I actually want to talk about a couple of specifics in the review, if you want, in just yeah, a bit sure. here. The but Peter Todd's review of Covenants, yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, in the general sense of consensus, you mentioned, actually, I'll, I'll read the the line or the, the examples you gave of, uh, just because I thought this was, the, the difference between or the, the trade-offs between salesmanship, earnestness, and pot stirring. And I thought, I thought that was funny because I went away and that stuck in my head for like the next 30 minutes. So I was like, oh shit, that's a great, like to, to kind of unpack that. Um, like, cause to me, what Ruben did kind of felt like pot stirring and, uh, or at least it, that was the result, even if it wasn't intended. Um, and part of me was like, well, that got the conversation rolling. And people were refusing to talk about it before that, really. Um, so I'm curious, like, what are those trade-offs? What is, you know, and th there's another there's another good point about, like, being earnest. 
is more you're going to tell more about negatives and that's going to lead fuel to because everything is a trade-off everything is a trade-off and i think people who reject the idea that not doing anything is a trade-off is foolish and then the people who say that no ctv is totally safe and there's no risk whatsoever i'm like dude a soft fork is a risk like if as soon as as soon as you're talking about changing something that itself is a risk you know like i don't even care about what change you're making you could just be fixing the the thing where what's the little weird thing about the time code we could just be fixing right, that time, but it's a trade-off because yeah. we're fucking changing something you know um so uh maybe kind of walk me through your thinking on that and do you have a strategy do you have a background <laughs> in sociology do you do you <laughs> <laughs> yeah man it is it's been it's been a ride the last year i i i came into kind of the more public bitcoin discourse very much on the earnestness camp. I, yeah. so, so I was, I was, I'm, I'm going to do very earnest education. I'm going to be as honest as I possibly can be about the benefits and trade-offs of everything that I'm talking about. And I'm, I'm really going to just try to get out there and be as, as genuine and, and clear in my communication as I possibly can. Um, how's that working out for you? But, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, mostly really well. I, you know, I think I, uh, I've, I've had some impact in doing, in doing that. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, but yeah, I, my background is more in engineering management. And so I've, I've seen how to work with people and how to motivate people. And the ways I've done that have been mostly through, uh, being as honest as possible while carefully choosing language. You can be honest about things while using specific words. I don't know if you've studied or read about neuro-linguistic programming at all. The, the specific word choices you use while being very earnest and honest can affect how a message is received. And so that was kind of the, the place where I came from originally was, I'm going to be as absolutely clear and honest as I can while helping people understand things um, through the choice of examples, the choice of words, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, and what was amazing to me was was to see that even doing that i i was getting kind of some some trauma based emotional responses and and so then i started to 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 think more about that approach is it even the the best approach and and so i've experimented a bit with pot stirring on purpose oh you're a troll too me too <laughs> i didn't want to be i i didn't want like the, I started this whole public Bitcoin persona thing, uh, uh, not wanting to to be in that situation. But what I found, and I and I I have mixed feelings about this, very like conflicted feelings. Mm -hmm. um, what I found is that there are some people where I wasn't making any progress in conversing with them. They were locked in a, essentially a loop, mm -hmm. and the only technique that I knew of to kind of potentially break that loop was to. Stir the pot a bit. Piss, piss them off. <laughs> yeah. Because when you, when you, you kind of raise their blood pressure to a certain degree. And, and now they have to respond. Them to have a thought. Yeah. yeah. And, and so, so I've done a little bit of pot stirring now. And I, I am deeply, deeply conflicted about it. Yeah. Uh, I prefer earnestness. I prefer that kind of clarity. I still feel that's the best long-term strategy. But I do agree there is like... It's like you need both. And I think also it's kind of important that those are put in different, like there's something about the association and how you build. <laughs> Did you hear this kid? Um, A little bit. Uh, the, the association and how you build uh, 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 relationships, like, like you structure relationships to certain people in your mind is that you, you give it, <laughs> you give it to, a role, you know, like you, you put someone in some role because you can never, you know, the, the degree to which, you know, anyone is always very, very shallow, especially when you're talking about large groups. It's increasingly just this tiny little, you know, I know Reardon code from that episode of Bitcoin Audible. You know what I mean? Like that's, there's only so much depth that we can get out of this conversation. Um, and so it's interesting that, uh, and it's also why I've always liked, even though I don't really do this because I mostly just because I'm lazy, but I also like this because of the idea of like a non accounts or pseudonymous, like secondary accounts where like I, you can be a troll and then you can be really honest and play right. in both of those things. And the troll can still incite the anger and encourage the convert, like get people out of their stupid 
boxes that they put themselves in. And then also champion kind of to just like, let's just be on, like, let's actually have an honest conversation and they can actually work off of each other. But I think there's some interesting element and this is not super, just, just something that like kind of pops into my head when I think about this all the time in, in having the, those separate roles for separate people. You know what I mean? Um, because there are some people who are just great at pot stirring and I'm, I'm like you, it, sometimes I'm having a lot of fun, but sometimes it's just like, ugh. like I just walk away feeling ugh about it. So yeah. I don't know. So I, I kind of, I, I get the way that you answered that is maybe the long thing that I'm trying to say there. <laughs> yeah. It, it's a, it's a tricky thing. One thing I would say is that I think it's true that there was too much salesmanship with the taproot soft fork in particular. And it wasn't, mm-hmm. I don't think, intentional, but it happened. The, the people talked about, oh, with Snore signatures, we might be able to do cross input signature aggregation and we might be able to do this and that and the other thing. Um, and and it, I think that's part of the now scar tissue or trauma that we're working through in Bitcoin consensus is that people felt like they were sold to and nobody likes to be sold to. Yeah. And so so now now we kind of have to, to figure out how to, to earn trust and 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 help people to 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 come back to trying to deeply understand things because I think what what happened was people were trying some people feel like they were trying to deeply understand what was going to come with Taproot they thought they understood and then it turns out they didn't and I've even talked to some very very technical people who who still think that we could have cross input signature aggregation within the existing Taproot outputs on the key path which is is not a possible thing. That's not that's not part of the design. It was yeah, given I, up. I thought that on the for path. a long time too. I don't know yeah. how many times I even said it on the show. Like that, this was just so cool that you could do this because that's a cool that's a cool ass idea. You know, <laughs> it's a good it, yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah. So 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 we do need to be very careful with that. And that's one thing that that while I may stir pots sometimes, I will I will continue to try and and really stay away from um from overselling because I think that's a it's a it's a thing we are now dealing with the consequences of where, where people thought they understood, they thought they were getting this set of things. And then when that didn't come, I, I, and you even see it in the way that some folks now go back and, and troll where they're like, Taproot was going to do this and it didn't do any of this. So how can we believe anybody? And that's kind of where they're stuck. They're stuck in this loop of, mm-hmm. I didn't get what I thought I was getting with Taproot and now I'm going to be mad forever. Uh, so I, I think we should avoid doing that again. As much as we can in trying to build consensus. That sounds like a simple strategy. That's that's I I I, I agree. Check guy, guy checks checks that box. <laughs> uh, but it's so hard, right? Because you're you're out there, whether you're me or anybody else, you're trying to 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 build consensus around doing something because you think for whatever your internal mindset is, you think that this change or that change is the best way forward, and you're trying to get people on board with that. And and it's so hard to not oversell that a little bit and say it also does this almost, you know, yeah. or it has this maybe potential someday because you really want people to come on board with your change. So I I don't blame yeah. anybody. I'm not trying to like cast shade about how things played out there. And nuance is so hard to, yeah. you know, if it doesn't even seem like a massive, especially when it's something like a primitive, like like CTV where it's like literally fundamental. And what's funny is the more, the more time goes on, the more I think about it almost like P2SH in the, the, like in a lot of the parts of how and where the soft work is kind of in the, the whole stack of stuff. Um, yeah. And uh, it's hard to explain to someone uh, obviously without a deep understanding, which is me most of the time, like it's, it's hard to convince myself that something that sounds minor could actually have big consequences or, or, or really big benefits or consequences in general um, down the line. And that if anybody has any degree of hesitancy or, you know, negative association with it, that that doesn't trump it when the perceived benefits feel minor too. You know what I mean? But, but yeah, they're okay. so fundamental that they can actually be a lot bigger than you think. You know, the idea of just being able to reliably and arguably simply split up the ownership of a UTXO, it seems like a very fundamental and very important piece 
because we have this strict UTXO limit that clearly is going to be here one day in some context. You know what I mean? So anyway. Yeah, it, it's really, it is really tricky. And I think that's, you know, that again, that's where I entered this conversation. I, I started out being CTV and then I had a lot of conversations with folks who were, who were saying basically, I'm not interested in a next soft fork unless it at least gives us rebindable lightning symmetry channels. And I think that's, that's a very reasonable position, frankly. Rebindable channels are a fundamental improvement to the Lightning Network. We know the Lightning Network gives us certain benefits already. And if we can improve the Lightning Network and also get some other potential benefits, that's, a, I think, a very reasonable perspective to have. So that's part of why you know I, I made my proposal some months ago, the Ellen Hans proposal, because with Ellen Hans, you get maybe things like arc and timeout trees and and kind of that category of scaling proposals that that are kind of more more uh, in depth UTXO sharing, let's say, but at least with Ellen Hans, you get Lightning symmetry channels. Mm -hmm. And because everyone was saying, you know, CTV alone is not enough because it doesn't do this thing that I care about. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it's not an unreasonable perspective that people are like, I don't want to consider this risky procedure of doing a soft fork unless I get a concrete benefit that I can kind of point at and say, I'm getting this. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I, I get it. I do. This is the Swan Bitcoin app, and this is how easy it is to just buy Bitcoin whenever you're feeling like it. And I feel like it right now. And as it shows me right here, I still have $9,388 worth of my $10,000 of Bitcoin buying that has no fees whatsoever. And now I have $10 more worth of Bitcoin. I do this quite often. One of the really great things about Swan is the incredible number of resources they have for learning and understanding anything that you want to know about Bitcoin. And importantly, they're going to teach you why you should not trade. They're not going to encourage you to trade. They are Bitcoin only. If you're looking for an easy and reliable way to get into Bitcoin, if you're looking to put Bitcoin in your IRA, if you're looking to put Bitcoin in your business, if you're looking to do anything around getting on a Bitcoin standard or getting exposed to Bitcoin in your portfolio, check out swanbitcoin.com slash guy is my special link and you will find it very conveniently right in the show notes. Well, this is a perfect segue, I think, into that because in Peter Todd's, a couple of the things that I wanted to know more about that I thought in the L2 review I would get the coin pool, L enhance. Um, what was there was another one that I was like, oh, I had, oh, cool, but this is mentioned in here. This is going to be great. And like, and almost all of them that I was very specific that I did not know anything about and I wanted to know about. He says, there's not really any good information on this, so we're not going to talk about it anymore. And I was like, oh, come on, Todd. What the hell? So maybe lead us into L enhance here. Explain L enhance. Oh, and I also just want to make a comment. Um, that I really like your like that framing of that. Well, why don't we just like let's just focus on how do we make lightning better? Because lightning is clearly a really awesome solution that has done so much. And it is arguably the only successful L2. Like it it really, it really just is for as much shade as everybody and in shitcoin and everything wants to give, lightning is an incredibly functional in like highly adopted layer two that is a genuine layer two um so i think from that perspective is like well how do we make lightning more streamlined how do we make lightning more um uh better at its job better at its job in all of the different ways and cross off some of those limitations or negatives i guess uh uh for lightning um and also just can you define rebindable real quick just exactly what that means just for the audience yeah, I mean, it's what we said earlier about how right now all transactions are bound to a specific UTXO. So like this transaction okay. must spend this UTXO. It's the only mm -hmm. one it can spend. But a rebindable transaction could spend this one or this one. If you have rebindable transactions, you can also have rebindable channels where this channel state is valid on any UTXO that matches the right shape as opposed to just the one channel point that was originally created. Mm -hmm. The reason that matters specifically is there's all these ideas about can we make um channel factories, where there's a bunch of people sharing a UTXO that spawn off a bunch of channels. And if we can have rebindable channels, then you can have a situation where the channel factory UTXO that has like 100 channels built off of it, you can actually 
take that channel factory UTXO, spend it to a new channel factory UTXO. But as long as it is still the same shape as the original channel factory UTXO, all those 100 all open those channels stay still open. Oh. Yeah. You don't have to have the interaction between all those 100 people to, to designate or have that new UTXO and say, come on, sign with me real quick. We have to do all this. You can do that unilaterally with one person. And you can also enforce the fact that it has to have that in in the expenditure. That's okay. So yeah, so that's why my re rebindable channels. The 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 most basic form of that is is the lightning symmetry channel where the the update transactions can rebind to each other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But the the broader idea, because the channels become rebindable at that point, is that you can also shift their underlying UTXO without having to re-sign a bunch of stuff. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, um, that that makes it a lot simpler to picture, I guess, in my head. Um, so tell me about L Enhance. What's what is different about L Enhance, and how exactly does it cover both grounds? I guess. Yeah. So that's that's where that was my again my whole entry into this public conversation was I was looking for there's this kind of argument of should we do any prev out or should we do CTV or should we do something else for kind of the next software for Bitcoin. And to me, when I entered the conversation, that's where I thought the conversation was, is that is it this thing or that thing? So Sigcash any prev out has a certain set of properties uh, which are both good and bad for various use cases. Sigcash any prev out is good for lightning symmetry channels um, on its own. Just that single Sigcash flag addition lets you do lightning symmetry channels. Um, they're a teeny tiny bit weird because of this data availability problem. I don't want to get into the details of that, but it exists. They're a little bit weird. Um, and then CTV on its own is is has this potential of building things like arc and timeout trees and better channel factories and all this other kind of UTXO sharing stuff. But they neither of them does their other the other ones thing very well. Mm -hmm. So that that's why um, uh, James O'Byrne made his Cove Tools soft fork proposal not too long before I stepped into the into the fray, if you will. And his Cov Tools proposal included both CTV and any prev out, along with his own Obvault, because he was saying, "Well, this because any prev out doesn't do everything CTV does, and CTV doesn't do everything that any prev out does. We want both." And then he, of course, had written Obvault, which he thinks is an important part of of kind of improving self custody for Bitcoiners. And that kind of I would say Obvault is really important for the middle tier of, of Bitcoin holders, so the more than a hundred thousand, less than ten million. In that area, Obvault is really helpful. So I get I'm on board with that category of of holders and and improving their experience. Um, anyway, so that was the context when I came in, and my frustration was that any prev out and CTV are actually very similar. If you look at what is hashed in the signatures for any prev out, if you do mm -hmm. signature any prev out any script, I think are the the two flags. Yeah. So if you do signature any prev out any script, the hash is almost, but not quite the same as the CTV hash. Now, the any prev out one has to be signed. The CTV one is just the hash with no signature. But the parts of the transaction they have hashed are almost the same. So I went down this whole path of trying to like figure out, is there a different thing we could do where we could make a more slightly more flexible SIG hash flag that would also get us the full CTV hash and it would still be signed? And so I designed this thing called um, template key. Which was which was a slightly more flexible version of Sig hash that allowed it to fully cover both CTV's use cases and any Prevout's use cases. Um, I realized that that was probably unnecessarily wearing the complicator's gloves, so I took off the gloves and I put them off to the side, and and that's when I I kind of developed the combination of L Enhance. And the reason L Enhance is useful is that the only thing that CTV was really missing from being able to do these lightning symmetry channels was the ability to sign the hash, right? Sig hash any prev out is a sig hash, so the hash is always signed. CTV is just a hash, so the hash is not signed. Mm -hmm. I needed to be able to sign this thing, and then I can do lightning symmetry channels. So L enhance is CTV plus check sig from stack, which lets me take the hash and sign it. Gotcha. Okay. And then added one more opcode, which is op internal key, because one other feature of sig hash any prev out, the actual change they make is not just adding SIG hash flags, it's also adding a new special kind of key, which is a one byte key. 
And that one byte key is replaced with the internal key of the um, taproot output before the signature is checked. And so op internal key is kind of the manual version of that. Instead of a magical one byte key that is replaced with the internal key, let me just give an op code for that. Op internal key takes the internal key and puts it on the stack for signature checking. Gotcha. So it just makes it an order of operations in doing the same thing that otherwise would be like its own tool, so to speak. Right. So it's deconstructing some of the pieces yeah. of opdo yeah, yeah, yeah. Bitcoin, right? We have opdo <laughs> Bitcoin, op check sig, and yeah. Ellen Hans deconstructs that a little bit. It lets you do the hashing, get then the key, the signature, and then, then check the yeah. signature. Gotcha. Okay. Interesting. So, so Ellen Hans is the, because I've heard this from a couple different people, and it might have been even you in a conversation at some point, um, but uh, that CTV needs to have CSFS, that it needs to have the check sig from stack with it in, in order, order to, to basically get the, channels or the real center, benefit yeah. that a lot uh, a lot of people are going for um that's also the big thing and I, and I thought that there was a construction of doing this with ctv where you could keep the ctv pool active or or force that the ctv pool could stay active by switching the utxo to a new one um but still basically have the tree of um, valid outputs for all of its participants stuck to it. Um, but yeah, you, you can do that with, with just ETV. Um, there's yeah, what's the everything caveat? has trade-offs. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah <laughs> what's the, about, what's right? the trade-off? Yeah. Um, if you just have CTV, the actual movement of the UTXO needs a standard signature on it which means that signature has to be made for that specific UTXO to move it to the next one that also includes the CTV tree. Okay. You kind of have to have it already built down in the, in the, the construction. You, you kind of already have to know where it's all going, basically. Well, it'd be more like at, at the time you want to move to a new UTXO. For mm -hmm. like a, you've got 100 people in this pool, and you want to move to a new UTXO that adds 101st person. At the time you want to do that move, you have to sign the route. Okay. Because that route has to be spent by a normal signature, with, which includes the UTXO in it, if you only have CTV. Because you can't have predetermined that move because you don't know who's going to want to join later. Mm -hmm. uh, potentially, with CheckSig from staff and CTV, you could have a pre-signature that is valid as long as it goes to a compatible new place mm -hmm. um, that's signed on the CTV. Again, there's annoying nuances in all of these things. Um, the biggest thing, honestly, with adding check sig from stack is is getting the rebindable channels, the, the yeah. lightning symmetry style channels. So CTV plus check sig from stack gets you lightning symmetry, channel, symmetry channels and the kind of existing discussed payment pool type constructions, whether they be arcs or payment pools directly or channel factories. CTV alone does arcs and payment pools and channel factories and then check sig from stack gets you the rebindable channels. Gotcha. Question then on the on thinking about trade offs, why do we want Ellen symmetry and why do we not want Ellen symmetry? I think the people that don't want it are being foolish. Okay, but I'll, I'll lay out. I'll try to steal man what they say nonetheless. We'll drop the opinion first. This is where our conclusion is going. <laughs> Let's do it. We're gonna we're gonna uh, we're gonna Tarantino this. We're gonna we're gonna start at the end yeah. and then go to the <laughs> go back to the beginning. Exactly. We'll, we'll do it backwards. So so yeah. So lightning symmetry channels. The benefit is that. Each party only needs to hold one piece of channel state for the duration of the channel. All they need to hold is the latest state that they want the channel to go to. So as we're updating the channel back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, sending funds back and forth, each of us is just holding the latest state we've seen. Yeah. And that's the only thing we need to hold to, to successfully close Backups the channel. Backups are easy. Yeah. Backups are easy. Right. With existing yeah. lightning channels, most of your listeners should know, but we'll say it anyway. Um, each party has to hold a revocation transaction specific to each previous state. So as you're doing changes, you're like, I got to hold this one, this one, this one, this one, this one. And you have to have a specific revocation for each previous state of the channel. Mm -hmm. There are some optimizations for that where you can have only revocations for channels where your balance was lower so that you don't get screwed. But in general, you have to hold every revocation transaction for the history of the channel. Yeah. And so Lightning Symmetry just makes the backups a single, always the same size, always one final state. That's, that's the reason we want it. Um, the other reason you might want it would be 
this symmetry aspect, which mm-hmm. is that um, has has two benefits to it. One is it's symmetry, which means that both parties hold the same data. Mm-hmm. You can actually, if you have a channel partner who you trust a little bit or you trust at the time you come back online, you can restore your channel from your partner mm-hmm. to a correct and fully functional state. Even if your channel, if you were offline for three weeks, whatever, come back online, your, your, your backups are gone. All you have is your seed. If your channel partners are nice and you trust them just a little tiny bit, you can say, give me the latest state. And if you're like, oh yeah, I remember that. That's the right state. You're back online. You didn't have to do a close. You didn't have to like any weird, uh, you're, you're back. Whereas with the lightning penalty transaction, because the, the states are asymmetric, you can never get the correct revocation transactions and, and fully restore your channel state in the same way because your partner doesn't have the same state as you. They have a different a different state, an asymmetric penalty state. Mm-hmm. Um, the other benefit of the fact that it's symmetrical or the, or, and this is where the potential downside comes in is that the incentives to not try and cheat are different. Yeah. In lightning penalty, if you close a channel with the wrong state, not the latest state, your channel partner can sweep all the funds in the channel to themselves. You lose your channel balance to your partner if you close with an old state. In lightning symmetry, because both parties hold the same final states. And if you publish an old state, we talked about this earlier, all the channel partner can do is correct it to the latest state. They can't Mm -hmm. penalize you. They can't take anything that wasn't ever theirs. All they can do is correct the state. So the lack of penalty, I would consider a feature, but some of the folks who don't want lightning symmetry would consider that a a worsening of the incentives around lightning. They, They think that channel partners will more frequently try to close with old beneficial states to themselves because there's not a penalty attached because the, the only cost, cost is a that. transaction fee basically right yeah yeah so so that's that's why you wouldn't want it like I, said, I disagree with that i think we've already shown over the course of lightning's uh what is it, six seven years of, uh, of mm-hmm. being at least partially active um we've already seen that lightning requires a modicum of trust with your channel partner even in lightning penalty your channel partner can can give you a pretty good screwing if they try to, yeah. right? They can. You're already locking up time and liquidity with them. And that's not a, it's not a decision that you just kind of make arbitrarily. You go and you exactly. select who you're connecting to. It's, it's, it's not trusted from a custodial point of view, but it's trusted from an taking action and how your access to your funds in a certain time period you absolutely are because if they're not there right. you're you're out you're out of funds for a week you you, you got to sit around and wait for this stupid force close to i'm mean, at right they can cost you some money and a lot of time yeah yeah so i i, I kind of agree with that um and so because we've seen like originally when lightning first came out everyone was just like open channels to anybody it's totally safe it's not a custodial it's so right. and and people got hurt and we've learned and because of the the way we've already learned about the properties of this network, again, as you said, you know, it's the one existing working layer too. So we've learned so much from it. And one of the things we've learned is that you have to have a certain degree of, of faith. It's like a little different than trust. You're not trusting them with your money, but you have to kind of trust them in taking actions. Like you said, yeah. keeping their node online, just being a decent partner. And because of that, I think Lightning Symmetry is the more correct relationship. This is not a direct adversarial relationship where you need to penalize someone. It's a collaborative relationship where all you need to do is be able to correct if a mistake happens. Yeah. And so that's the the difference in thinking about whether you need to have that penalty or whether symmetry is really the more correct representation of the relationship that already exists. Yeah. I'm curious, do you know of a way let's let's take the framing that this is actually a negative to have um to lose the uh to lose the penalty because you do change the incentives. And, you know, there's there's a, certainly an argument to be made that, you know, that hasn't been a problem to date. And the anybody who's ever had to do a punishment, like nine times out of 10, it's a, hard, a failed hard drive. Or it's, it, you know, it's not, it's not someone being malicious. It's because there's been some sort of a mistake and they're getting punished for no reason just because the punishment clause is the only thing the other person has, you know, um, that actually works. Um, well. In that same sense, you you also have an argument that, well, that's because the Lightning Network works like that because we have punishment clauses, you know? 
Um, so, of course, we don't have a lot of examples of punishments being enacted because the incentives are there not to do it. Um, so there's there's that element. Um, but uh, well, actually, uh, before before we go on to the next thing, what's what would how would you address that if that seemed if that's a reasonable argument? It's entirely reasonable that people might still sometimes use penalty transactions mm-hmm. or sorry, penalty channels, right? It, Adding lightning symmetry to the network doesn't mean that everyone has to use it on every channel. You can have a lightning network uh, of yeah, yeah. where this hop is is penalty, this hop is symmetry, this hop is penalty. There's there's no incompatibility there. HTLCs route through either type of channel equally. Mm-hmm. And so you can you could have a network that's heterogeneous in that way, and people can choose which kind of channel fits their specific partner and and negotiate, frankly, during channel open, which one is best suited. Um, so that's, I think one thing that people, people, I think have this like all or nothing idea about it. It doesn't have to be all or nothing. It can be a mix. You know, my speculation is that it would end up being all symmetry because the, the benefits far outweigh the, the potential downsides to it. But mm-hmm. if I'm wrong, that's fine. I think there are definitely a lot of places on the network where lightning symmetry channels just make more sense. If you're an LSP who has a relationship with people, they're buying channels from you. They're paying you to have a channel already. Um, symmetry channels just make more sense. It makes your mm-hmm. client software for your customers simpler. Uh, it makes your your kind of uh, customer support simpler. If that customer loses their phone, all you do is close with the final state. There's no risk mm-hmm. to it. Like It's just a better situation for those relationships. But maybe there are places where you want to be able to have a somewhat more adversarial channel where you want to have that, that penalty available to you and you open a penalty channel with that person. Now, I'm curious, is there a way that you know of or that's possible without changing the UTXO? Um, granted, technically, you could change it with CTV plus CF, CSSF, but um, <laughs> uh, without changing it, that you could actually have punishment, have the punishment clause and the symmetry based on the conditions of the transaction. Like, let's say we're doing updates with 21 sats back and forth, 100 sats, 1,000 sats. Well, I'm just going to do, I'm not going to, I'm not going to worry about signing a punishment clause or something for this one. But then 500,000 sats come through in a transaction. Let's sign a punishment clause for this one, because this one's going to revoke a lot, a lot of the funds in this channel towards that other person. And if they use this update, like basically like a checkpoint system where Every so often when enough funds have shifted in one direction or the other, which may be transactions right back to back, but sometimes it is 20 transactions before it actually gets to that amount where it's actually feasible. Like, I don't even know if that's technically feasible um, to do in the same channel, but is is there some sort of a mutual construction that seems like a technically possible, maybe? I don't know of one. I am definitely mm-hmm. not the best thinker about these these lightning updates. I've I've learned a fair amount about it, but I, mm-hmm. I'm not the the one who would know these these kind of things. There has at least been a proposal for a um, Cash any provout based penalty style. There were some downsides to it that I don't remember the details of, and I don't know whether you could mix updates between plain symmetry updates and penalty updates within the same channel. I, it, it seems plausible that that could be done yeah like so if you're i like what you say yeah so if you're, if you're shifting a significant fraction of the channel's balance your partner might not accept that update without you signing a penalty clause for them mm-hmm. um yeah it seems plausible but I, I i would have to do a lot of script hacking to figure out whether it's actually possible yeah it might be there's plenty of plausible sounding things that once you get down <laughs> to it, it's like yeah. yeah you have to close and reopen the channel to do this so i don't think that's gonna work um yeah and the other thing i've been thinking about is I I think, and I can't 100% swear to this, but I, I think that without going on chain, I think you can switch a channel from penalty to symmetry, but not back. Interesting. I wouldn't, again, I wouldn't swear to that. There's some nuances in terms of whether those old states could become a problem. Yeah. But, and I think what you'd have to do is you'd have to hold on to the states up to that point for revocation. You would still need to maintain the channel safety. 
but I think you could then switch it to a symmetry channel for future updates so you no longer have to keep accumulating penalties once the appropriate opcodes are available. Interesting. Huh. I have to look at that. Now I'm, now I'm really curious about that. But um, um, can you rebroadcast that with the same signature and change the amount that you have allocated for the fee? Maybe I completely just making that up. I I am struggling with the details of that. Mm -hmm. The the biggest development that's happening around fees is really the um, ephemeral dust and truck transactions work that Greg Sanders and Gloria and Merch and all of them have been working on for a long time now. Mm -hmm. um, that that's really as far as I know the, the biggest thing happening around channel fees, and it applies to both penalty and symmetry, where you instead of having to have two anchor outputs and having to have the original transaction pay enough fees to relay. You can put all the fees into the into the anchor, and and have a zero fee um, commitment transaction, which then gets pulled through by the anchor. Uh, so I don't I don't think the CTV or or oh that's what it was. Okay, yes, it's coming back to me. Lightning symmetry using any prev out has the opportunity to do what you said, where the fees can be dynamically okay. allocated potentially because any prev out, you can use Sikash, any prev out, Sikash single, where you only sign one of the outputs, but not the other with the original um, signature. And then you can add an additional signature on additional input for fees into the one transaction. So instead of having to use an anchor output and then a new transaction spending that, in a single transaction, you can add an input for fees and change the size of the second output to adjust the fees because you have sole control of that second input and output. Okay, gotcha. Um, yeah. From talking to Greg about that, given the the mempool as it was at least when he was developing Lightning Symmetry implementations, there were pinning attacks against that con construction, and so he he developed an example of Lightning Symmetry that did not have that feature where it used Sigcash any prev out Sigcash all, um, and did not have that feature. If you're using Lightning Symmetry built with CheckSig from Stack and CTV, it does not have that feature because CTV always commits to all outputs. Gotcha. So the, okay. There's, as always, there's so much nuance. And this would specifically negate that, but because of a potential attack, not because of, you know, any, uh, just, just because that actually needs to be that opens up a, a problem as much as it opens up a benefit in that. Yeah. And so they're currently the thinking is to use, use the ephemeral dust instead, essentially. And so yeah. the, the difference in total bytes used on chain between a single ephemeral dust anchor and the, uh, and using that, that other construction where you put the input into the actual commitment transaction with a one, a second output, it's only a few bytes of additional space. I think the, it's like, 15 or 18 bytes or something of extra total okay. space mm -hmm. um, to do the ephemeral dust style versus that. Is it, is it more? Yes. Is it so much more that it's going to kill us? No, it's less than this. It's less than the fee cost of, or it's about the same fee cost as one signature. You know, it's not a big difference. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. Interesting. So uh, Peter's conclusion in his article was uh, and I thought this was a really interesting take, and I hadn't quite considered this, is to try to figure out how to get a go through the soft fork process just by doing something, quote unquote, easy um, that let's do a consensus cleanup. Let's just kind of clean up these things that have been lingering for a really, really long time and make them unbroken or unbugged, so to speak, so that we don't have to work around them. And then use that as a base to say, okay, well, this is how we may or ought to do a soft fork when we actually want to do the upgrade. Like, what's your what's your take on that? And um, actually, I'll just, we'll start there. What's your take on that? <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm totally fine with that. I I hesitate to kind of say, this is the path we, we should take. Um, sure. Yeah, there's, yeah, yeah. there's many ways we could go about this. And I, I said, I, I've said this before, but it's worth reiterating. I think that changes to Bitcoin should be made when they're ready and well understood and safe and neither before nor after. So um, 
I, exactly when that's going to be for the contentious cleanup work. They're they're finding some nuances in even doing the contentious cleanup work that makes that work right now less ready than something like CTV. Uh, CTV, I would say on its own, is ready, but it's not ready be, uh, in the sense that it doesn't give the benefits that some people specifically want around rebindable channels. So maybe it's not ready from that perspective. The point is, we should just do these things when they're ready, not before, not after. And I wouldn't try to say we should do it in this sequence or that sequence. Um, consensus is a is a nuanced and ever shifting target, and we I think we have to be flexible in how developing consensus looks and how soft forks look. We don't. It, it's funny that some people have. I, I had a brief chat with Luke the other day on on X and. And he, he was like, this is how soft forks have to look. You know, it's not a soft fork. It's it's a, a attack unless it looks like this. Yeah. And and it's fascinating to hear that because we literally don't know. The last time we did a soft fork, Bitcoin was a fraction of the size that it is today. Yeah. And to, so to to assert that this is what it looks like. And none like of the soft, soft forks fork have been the be same. Attack. Right. They've all been different. They've all been different. Every single thing, the the flag, the the minor thing, the node thing, the time span, they, they've all been different. All of them just they don't there's no standard. And yeah. I completely agree. It's it's a completely we don't even know what this thing looks like. And that's the problem with we consensus, right? There's no <laughs> like it's outside of consensus. It's some totally different layer that we're trying to make a decision on. And it's a mess. It's really easy if you're just like, well, yeah, Bitcoin works this way. Um, yeah. But soft fork is not a part of how Bitcoin works. Yeah. And mm. the thing that I think people have to get comfortable with is that at the end of the day, soft fork consensus will only be determined by game theory. Mm -hmm. And there's no, that's the highest layer. That's the layer that will make the final determination. It's not what Bitcoin Core puts in the code base. It's not what miners do or do not signal for. At the end of the day, it's going to be game theory that determines the outcome. I am not a game theory expert. I have some theories, some ideas about how it might play out. I've been posting about those recently. But the fact is, it is not whether the miners signal. It is not whether the nodes run this or that software. Because these are backwards compatible changes, what's going to determine the outcome is game theory. And it's going to be who is willing to fight against this with their money, who is willing to, to rally kind of political opposition to this, who is going to publicly run, uh, uh, bet their coins against or for a specific thing. You know, you can lock your coins in ways that are going to bet on one outcome or the other. There's all kinds of game theory that can play out in determining the outcome here. And, and it, I think people that have a very rigid idea of how software consensus is going to be reached are, are going to find themselves in a, in a bit of discomfort. So I've been trying uh, in my earnest way to, to put out there the idea that we we do need to, to look at the game theory and look at it kind of with an open mind of all the different strategies that players can use in that game theory uh, to, to try and drive the outcome they're looking for. Yeah. yeah. I'll tell you my personal... Um subjective thinking on the the strategy or whatever i always felt that like proposing a soft fork with and making a client with something with those things that feel ready and then just giving it the longest time span that that seems sober um that, that doesn't make you just go oh god really like literally like 10 years give it a 10 year flag day or some crap and then somebody's like, oh, it says an attack. It's like, dude, it's 10, it's 10 years. We, like all of this, I, I'm giving you the time, all the time in the world you need to hate on this, to contest this, to put it in a different client in a different way, whatever. I'm just saying, let this, let's see what happens and set ourselves a timeline so that in the absence of anything of all of the competition and, and all the uh, the caveats and all the the um the attacking of it and everything in the absence of consensus against it so to speak um that the people who want to run that client can get it and they may still not use it maybe it's still only like 10% minor uptake and 15% node uptake well nobody should use that because it's not secure but it, there is an element like it's a soft work it's backwards compatible 
I could run a client right now with a soft fork and use it right now, day one. It's just that nobody, it, nobody's going to enforce it. You know what I mean? Right. You'd be so risking your coins every time you transact. I'm risking my coins it. every time I use it. Um, so part of me just thinks that to go about it that way and because it's a mixture of, listen, like there's no, like trying to convince someone that that's an attack, I feel like is, is hard. You know, if like if I said three months right now and I'm just like start calling all the miners and stuff, that feels like an attack. There's like, oh my God, I have to make a decision. I hate you. Um, yeah. And whereas if you just give it such a gross timeline of like nobody, like this is just totally up in the air. But at the same time, we could start to plan for this. We could start to build for it now. And it suddenly starts making sense. If you have 5%, 10% node uptake, it starts sense. It makes sense to actually make an investment to, all right, well, let's build out ARC with it, yeah. you know? Um, and it's also, it's, it, it feels like a, just the right amount of pot stirring at the same time to, <laughs> to, to get, the, get people mad about it to start talking. So I don't know. I don't know. So that's just that's my brilliant master plan to to, to get something. Yeah, there's, there's a similar strategy that I think um, Shinobi was kind of doing the the last time around with Taproot, which is you can also just make a client that doesn't have an activation at all. It just starts enforcing it, right? Mm -hmm. You you could make a client that just assumes OpCat was active or OpCTV was active from the beginning mm -hmm. of time because there are currently no conflicting transactions, uh, a, a client that enforces OpCTV from day zero of Bitcoin is compatible with the, with everything with that's the blockchain already. as it is. Yeah. So forget activation, just turn it on. Yeah. And, and that client, if people start running that, and you could, you could make it, um, you know, since Peter Todd already wrote the preferential peering code for Libre Relay, you could make it a preferential peering network so that you can kind of get a sense of how big that network is by preferentially peering. And you could just have it enforcing, but not use it unless the nodes enforcing it become powerful enough that you trust it. Yeah. You don't have to do a flag day. You don't have to do an activation. Don't use this. Don't you don't use this right now. It's not an idea, but we're enforcing it. You know, that's a good yeah. point. That's a really good yeah. point. Now you um, risk forking yourself off if anyone publishes a conflicting transaction. So you don't want to be mm -hmm. dumb about this. I'm not I'm not yeah, suggesting yeah. that this is a risk free uh, thing to do. But I, I again, the, the point of everything that you said, and, and what I'm saying here is that this is not a there's not there's a no clear, clear path. There's not a right yeah. way and a wrong way. Uh, people can do what they want. It's an it's an anarchic consensus network, and people are going to take risks. Some people will take bigger risks and smaller risks. Some people are going to get burned. Some people are not. And let's be comfortable with that reality. We live in the world of Bitcoin, where where game theory is going to rule. Yeah, yeah. Well, that feels like that feels like a good um, a, a good place to end. And I've taken a lot of your time already. Uh, dude, thanks. Thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for sitting down and chatting with me about this. This this has cleared up a lot of things that I've been desperately wanting to ask people on this. And it's really, fuck, it's hard to find answers sometimes. Um, yeah, I need to do more writing on that topic. Yeah. It's hard to get clear answers. And, and I don't love consuming long form written content. But I know many people do, so I need to start I reading you. more. I got you. So that uh, I, got, yeah. I, I know it. I know a show. I know a show. I'll tell oh you yeah, about you, it. you know a show. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've listened to yeah plenty of audio books. Thank you. <laughs> oh man, so, yeah. Thank you so much. It's a great, great chat. Yeah, I, I love to get this stuff out there more, and um, yeah, love love chatting. Thank you. Any uh, any final thoughts? What's uh, if you wanted to sum it up, or was there something that you really wanted to add uh, that never felt right? Uh, give me, give me your, give me your final words and then I will shoot you and we will close this out. <laughs> yeah, I, I would say my final word is, is for all of us to continue working on setting aside our emotional reactions to things and focus on understanding things deeply. Let your emotions follow your understanding. Um, and, and I think we can all have better conversations that way. And I, I struggle with it as well. So this is not a uh, throwing stones or whatever. It, it's something that we can all work on uh, and, and learn and, and kind of develop better Bitcoin together. So I like that. That's a very earnest and sensible thing to close out on. So amen. Amen to that. All right, man. Well, uh, thank you again. And uh, I'll have details and everything in the show notes to follow you. If you do any writing on this, always send it my way. I'm around. I do that. I do a thing called reading quite a bit. So uh, let me know. <laughs> Sounds great, man. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, boss. 
All right. That wraps up our conversation. Another shout out to Read and Code for doing this, for, for answering the questions and for great input and also just fantastic work. I always appreciate being able to get into these issues and get a lot of answers all at once and from someone that I feel is giving an honest perspective and is trying their best also to be objective and to account for where they are obviously making mistakes as as I often make mistakes and have a completely false or very shallow view of things going into them. So that's just something I really appreciate and it's always good to have those people to lean on for conversations like this that often get difficult or obnoxious in Twitter land and social media. With that, don't forget to check him out. Don't forget to follow him. If you don't, you're very much missing out, not only for his earnestness, but also his occasional pot stirring. And I will have links to socials, impubs, all those good things uh, so that you can get up with and follow him if you would like right down in the description of this show where you will also find our sponsor who supports the show and also keeps my Bitcoin safe, the makers of the cold card hardware wallet. And there is a discount code and there is a special link and you can let them know that I sent you and you can keep your Bitcoin safe and you can actually own it. And all of those are good things. Like there's nothing. All, that whole list was just nothing but great things. So you should do it and you should check it out. And then of course, uh, last shout out to the Audionauts and uh, everybody who boosts and you know leaves comments. Uh, on Fountain and Zaps Me on Noster. Love you guys, and I will catch you on the next episode of Bitcoin Audible. And until then, everybody, take it easy, guys. (laughs) 